Hey, welcome to our next session as part of the NET English training program. Uh, we're on to session eight, which is literature through time. Uh, my name's Nathan Corfey. I'm a director of English as part of NET. And in this session, we're going to focus on the, the very small task of uh, 4,000 years worth of literature and condensing that into about 20 minutes uh, of a session. So apologies in advance for the things I miss out, for the things I get wrong. Um, there'll be people with far more knowledge about certain topics and certain uh, areas than me. Uh, but the aim of this session is really to weave it all together, uh, that we can look at the overview of literature, particularly in its history uh, in the United Kingdom, and start to look for those connections that will help us as teachers in the classroom to give context that's relevant and interesting to the students that we teach. So this session uh, is intended to explore English literature in all its glorious breadth, depth and tracking the key events, genres and movements. So we're thinking uh, right from the beginning, uh, we're going to go uh, literally to the beginning of uh, written text uh, with texts like the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Oral Tradition. And we're going to move through uh, this session uh, into the 19th century, into Victorian literature. And next session will be Ashley Potts, who will take us right up to present day into the 20th and 21st century texts and look at how kind of the, the ideas and the themes and the, uh, the form that we've looked at here informs uh, modern literature as well. So we're going to explore topics like uh, where do canonical and non-canonical authors fit within the timeline of English literature? So we're thinking about where they actually are written and, and how they influence each other. Um, how does the ever-shifting context of our country and world influence the literature produced? Because obviously um, our context uh, informs our content. So the way in which the world in which we live now is a very different world from the world they lived in 2000 uh, or 500 years ago and thinking about the relevance of that. And again, making sure it's not just bolt on context, it's not just showing off context, it's actually relevant and interesting context. And finally, to what extent do major works in English literature influence each other and what legacy do they leave? And that's really the core of what we're doing here. We're looking at an overview of the curriculum that we're teaching from year seven uh, to 11 and into A level but we're looking at the, the timeline and how these texts, these authors have influenced each other um, and continue to influence us, uh, both as authors and readers in the present day. So we think about chronological continuity. The aim uh, of the session is to go from Shakespeare to Shelley in about 1,200 seconds. Um, so, you know, again, no small task. Uh, but if you look at our um, curriculum and the texts and authors that we study, uh, we're going to focus in this area here, uh, mainly 16th century to 19th century. We will discuss briefly uh, the time before that. But this is our, our area of focus uh, today. And I want us to consider each of these authors that we are teaching um, in our lessons. And again, it's not just, oh, that's interesting. It's, okay, how is this relevant? And how do these authors connect in with each other? Because one of the key things we want to be doing is connecting uh, the dots for students as they move from year seven into year 11, they get to see that continuity of, of idea, that continuity of, of structure, of form, of language, and that will inevitably aid them in their written responses and going further in their lives as well as they go into uh, knowledge um, that is kind of cultural capital as well. Okay, so here's a little map of of where we're going today. So we've got a map of the UK because we're predominantly staying within um, authors from, from Great Britain as part of the curriculum. But we will begin with pre-Shakespeare. There was a time before Shakespeare. And we're looking at about 2100 BC up until 1590. So a massive space of time, but obviously in that time, not a lot of text written, but we're going to look at three aspects there, the oral tradition, the biblical tradition, and the medieval tradition. So those three traditions that, of course, influence the next place we're going to go, which is Shakespeare. So we're looking at uh, around 1590 to 1611, the times in which he was prolific as a writer. And we're going to look at aspects of tragedy, aspects of comedy, and aspects of sonnet writing. We could have gone into aspects of history, 
and his historical writings, but um, I think this will be more relevant for what we're doing in the classroom in terms of form of poetry. We're going to move on from there. Uh, we're going to jump to 1837, so we're moving into the Victorian period then, and we're looking at different aspects of, of Victorian writers, most specifically uh, Gothic writing, uh, social protest writing or the social novel and feminist writing which became again more prevalent in this period now if we're going to end in a place that's kind of overlapping because obviously these times are happening at the same time but there's a kind of a, 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 a kind of a contrast that I want to draw here and that's romanticism which kind of again it, these dates aren't exact but around up to about 1900 and we've got the history the philosophy and the poetry of romanticism so yeah we're going from Shakespeare to Shelley um, and as I said previously uh, Ashley Potts will take us uh, right through into the next part I don't know if the map will go into France or the rest of the world I'm not sure um, but that's where we're aiming to go in our session today so this time period before Shakespeare isn't really a time period that we explore uh, specifically and in depth with students but it is certainly something that informs what we do it certainly informs Shakespeare um, but it also is uh, is important for us when we think about the history of language itself so we want to start in the oral tradition so the fact that uh, before there was writing stories were told orally and the transmission of narrative which was uh, mostly through yes through speech but also song folk tales ballads chants prose and verses which of course ultimately influence um, Shakespeare and other writers of the period so when I think about that oral tradition and how that even impacts uh, today uh, biblical writing which obviously has a profound influence on all writing and culture so the Hebrew and Greek texts um, that were translated into English in the King James Bible in 1611 and that date uh, particularly which is kind of the, the last date I think that's the, the, the date that um, Shakespeare wrote The Tempest uh, and there is a kind of a little debate as to whether or not uh, the book that Prospero um, is reading from could be related uh, to King James and his Bible because King James had that fascination with the supernatural but we're going to look at the influence of, of the Bible specifically and those texts and then we're going to look into medieval writing so how uh, this time period was dominated by religion as influenced uh, by the Bible and romantic adventure and chivalry which of course we know uh, will influence Shakespeare and beyond so when we think about uh, the oral tradition obviously we don't have uh, evidence of that no one took any you know, mp3 players with them uh, to record these songs and, and stories around the campfire um, from tribes and and so on but the oldest text that we have is the epic of Gilgamesh which is dated approximately 2100 BC and it's written on 12 tablets uh, and yet it's the oldest text in the world and it is an epic in other words long poem uh, written in ancient Mesopotamia um, and it's an interesting story and I'd you know I'd recommend you read it uh, just in terms of understanding of mythology and there's loads of kind of cross-pollination with with uh, the Bible as we'll go into but other um, sources of mythology um, and the story is about uh, Gilgamesh who is this kind of god figure and he has he's befriended this wild man uh, essentially mankind Enkidu uh, and they undertake a series of quests uh, in order to discover immortality and it's written in two separate sections two very different sections uh, but as I say it's really interesting lots of key aspects that would define uh, the oral tradition so repeated refrains so this idea that you'd have a continual kind of almost like a chorus or certain phrases that are said again and again and again and the purpose of that was for the, the, the storyteller that you'd help them remember the story so they have these these cues with these um, repeated refrains to help them uh, remember so you've got that in there as a kind of ode to uh, the oral tradition then we've got tropes from adventure so adventure stories very much take from uh, from the epic of Gilgamesh the hero's journey we can see that evident even in the oldest text known to man and it, what's interesting as well and it might be something that you want to bring into a lesson at some point uh, particularly in key stage three are the contemplations on the human condition that are, that are outlined uh, 
here, what it means to be human. And so this text could have its place uh, in a lesson um, on any text, really, that we're studying in order to look at that parallel between, for example, Macbeth and his pursuit of the human condition, his, his questioning of who he is, and you could link that in um, if it's relevant. So the influence this has is the Bible, the parallels between Epic of Gilgamesh and the Genesis story is is really striking um, to the point where it, you know theories are that the 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 text Genesis text was influenced by the Epic of Gilgamesh or vice versa. But we do have a definite story of a flood, um, which wiped out mankind in this big this kind of theme of renewal and restarting. Um, so essentially pressing control alt delete on the world, um, and then this story of Adam and Eve is also. Um, evident in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So again, this kind of age-old tale of the fall of mankind and the ultimate redemption of mankind, but also the relationship between the male and the female, which of course influences uh, the medieval um, writings and Shakespeare's writing. And it also has an influence on Homer. So the Odyssey and the Iliad have clear allusions to the Epic of Gilgamesh. It was clearly influenced by that trope of adventure, um, and mythology as well. So quite an interesting text to bring out in lessons, but also just an interesting text for ourselves to understand the genesis of language narrative and the written word. Okay, so moving on from there to the Holy Bible, which has a, a very large time span if you look at the whole thing. Obviously, Old and New Testament takes us from 1200 BC, so around the time that the Epic of Gilgamesh was uh, dated, all the way to 100 AD, so into the New Testament, into Greek. So we span different cultures and even different languages with Hebrew in the Old Testament and the Greek in the New. And it goes without saying that this text has influenced um, so many different uh, texts that we read. Um, having some kind of biblical literacy really does help us uh, as teachers and students of literature to understand what we're reading because the audiences of Shakespeare's day, the medieval day, even the Victorian day, would have had this biblical literacy where allusions that are made and, and images and motifs that are drawn out would have been obvious to them where they aren't for us today. Um, so the narrative, of course, is ultimately about the fall and redemption of mankind um, and was translated into English uh, on commission of King James in 1611. And that's when we see a lot of the phrases, particularly from the King James Bible, entering into the vernacular um, of the people that even today we use certain phrases that we don't realize are biblical phrases. And so um, the writers uh, throughout history have done the same. So we do see aspects of the oral tradition, particularly in the Old Testament. So again, what we saw in Gilgamesh, repetition of phrases, but also uh, repetitive parallelism, uh, repetitive parallelism being um, when you have two lines which mirror each other almost, again, as a way of remembering the text. Uh, we get recurring imageries throughout um, the Bible. So colors and numbers all being meaningful. And the fact that uh, obviously we have different writers writing in that tradition, but they're all taking on these same motifs is, is really interesting and obviously influences writers in terms of tracking motifs all the way through. So for example, numbers are important. Number seven being a number of completion and number six being the number of man. And we have colors having meaning. So silver having the, the kind of connotations of redemption. You think about Judas and the, 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 the 12 um, um, coin, silver coins that he takes to betray Jesus. So you get all these kind of uh, links coming through as well as the key themes of sin, redemption and restoration. And these are the basis of almost all narratives. Um, and so we see that influence there. We see it throughout Western culture. As we said before, Shakespeare um, has so many parallels with the Bible. I mean, one of the um, theories is that Shakespeare himself helped translate um, the King James Bible. It's one of those things where he obviously was around at the time um, and was obviously a master of language. It could be, um, but there's so many parallels between them, you know, that that, that theory uh, does hold some water. And obviously medieval and Victorian literature in particular, because of the religious nature of society, um, have, huge inf uh, have been hugely influenced uh, by that text. Okay, so then we're going to move uh, into medieval writing. So 
Uh, we're looking particularly at the Canterbury Tales, which was dated around 1387 to 1400. So, um, and seeing the influence of the oral tradition, which is obviously still evident in medieval writing because there wasn't as much of it, um, but as well as the, the influence of, of the Bible as well. So the Canterbury Tales specifically is a collection of 24 stories in Middle English that Henry Chaucer wrote um, and it's presented in a very clever way. So lots of different individual stories, but they're held together uh, in a kind of a contest they're having where they're having a storytelling contest for the pilgrims traveling uh, to Canterbury to visit the shrine of St. Thomas a Becket. And um, the idea of it being a frame narrative is interesting. So a frame narrative being stories within stories, which ultimately influences um, Shakespeare. So, for example, in The Midsummer Night's Dream, we get that frame narrative, a play within a play. Uh, we have the, the kind of the, op the beginnings of heroic metre, which ultimately influenced iambic pentameter. Um, so again, Shakespeare and his sonnets and, and pretty much everything he wrote um, being influenced by that, as well as uh, we see the satire of the class system, which is really something new with Chaucer. So this idea that um, the, he's kind of uh, making a distinction between upper and lower classes in the, in the way they talk, and you, up until... Um, Chaucer really medieval writing focused on the higher end of society and the knights and the you know the kings whereas uh, Chaucer decides to describe the common man and this kind of is where we have the beginnings of maybe more socialist writers and and the kind of writing of of J.B. Priestley Dickens these kind of writers you can see the the kind of the beginnings of that um, in the medieval writing of Chaucer as well as ideas of predestination so the fact that we're all stuck in where we're at, where we're at. If your da dad was a baker, you'll be a baker, and so that idea that we're we our destiny is set, something that Shakespeare takes on, and court courtly love as well. Uh, again, something that's evident in the sonnets. So we can again see that that kind of thread line of literature coming through from the oral oral tradition into the biblical writings up into the medieval times. Okay, so on to Shakespeare then, and again, apologies that I'm hacking history here and just kind of running through things in a, you know, in, in this kind of way, but we want to look at what's relevant and specific for our teaching and our students. So we'll look at tragedies. So these are plays which do draw from the Greek tradition. Now, I haven't had a chance to go into Greek mythology, and obviously that does have influence on on Shakespeare, it has influence on the Romantics, and um, but it's that idea of a tragic hero who suffers a downfall due to hubris or some kind of fatal flaw. So tragedies, then we've got comedies, which are uh, not necessarily funny, although they do include puns and you know hilarious things in Shakespeare's day like dressing up and, and switching roles, but it does usually have a happy ending. Often it's a marriage and it's usually the struggle of some young lovers to overcome um, the elders in the community or some kind of family tension uh, and then again we could have looked at histories but we're going to look at sonnets so those one stanza 14 line poems in iambic pentameter and usually on the topic of romantic love I say usually because we know that Shakespeare likes to mix things up so we think about tragedy and the aspects of tragedy uh, if you look at the screen on the in the blue box there we've got a list of Shakespeare's tragedies from Antony and Cleopatra uh, uh, right through to the ones that we uh, would usually study in, in school and certainly part of our curriculum, so Macbeth, Othello, Romeo and Juliet. If you look, they're all titled with a name, a person's name or maybe two people's names, um, and that's not insignificant. None of the um, comedies do that. Um, perhaps it could be because of what Shakespeare's doing in these tragedies in that it's almost a psychoanalysis of the character. It's named after Macbeth because we're diving into his kind of psyche, into, you know, people would have known kind of the general stories about these people. Often they were um, based on real people, but what Shakespeare is interested in is, yes, we know this person's a villain. We know they're awful. We know about this, um, this, this Scottish king who was like a tyrant, but what made him that way? And he seems quite interested. That's quite a modern uh, idea, really, that he would look deep into the history and, and, and the context of a person. And so usually we have a hero, 
obviously a tragic hero who suffers a downfall due to their tragic flaw. So ambition in the case of Macbeth, jealousy in the case of Othello, and so on. Uh, key aspects are we often in these tragedies, and Shakespeare loves to do this, we hear of this hero before we actually meet them. So the first couple of scenes, um, all we hear is about the hero. So in Macbeth, Act 1 is the witches talking about him, Act 2 is the uh, the, the the king and his uh, the soldiers talking about him you know Othello we do the same thing and the idea is that um, it creates a stage for the uh, the hero we get a sense of their reputation and it creates a sense of anticipation for us in the audience uh, we get a fatal flaw in the character so they'll always have something which you know will be manipulated usually by the malcontent um, and the settings often important as well we get often very claustrophobic settings. Usually this happens throughout the, the play. It goes from being very wide open spaces into tight spaces to emphasize the, the mental journey of the character. And so often the setting reflects their mental state. The influence uh, that's, that Shakespeare took was obviously the Greek tragic um, traditions. So hubris, peripatia, catharsis, all these um, kind of Greek ideas, uh, as well as predestination. So that medieval tradition, which is based in a kind of religious belief in you have your place in society is set and you must stay in that place. And often these tragedies were warnings about people with self-determination, people who tried to step out of their, their role in society, which is ironic when you think about Shakespeare and, and his humble beginnings and who he became, but he seems to be kind of perpetuating that, um, that belief of you stick within your pre-prescribed uh, role. Uh, and as well as, as we said before, countless biblical allusions and imagery that he uses throughout and has an influence right through into, um, as I'm sure uh, Mrs. Potts will talk about, Arthur Miller, for example, in A View from a Bridge um, and his other tragedies, Death of a Salesman, which may be studied at A-level. And you can see the progression of the tragic convention throughout. And then, of course, we've got Shakespeare's comedies. And again, we've got a list of those on the screen. And most specifically, we'll be looking um, at a Midsummer Night's Dream in year seven. Um, and so we're introducing them to Shakespeare. And when we do that, obviously, we've got very different ideas in the tragedies, which comes out later uh, when they study Othello in year eight. But what we're doing is introducing them um, to Shakespeare's language, to Ch Shakespeare's style. And so, again, we've got the... Um, the idea of a happy ending, a marriage, very sharp contrast with the tragedies. Uh, we have a lot of puns, um, complex plot lines, which is done deliberately um, to kind of create a sense of confusion. Uh, the frame narratives we discussed before, mistaken identities, we often have a clever sermon, caricatures, very important. That becomes important later on, particularly with people like Dickens and the way that he characterizes people and even J.B. Priestley with his characterization of, of Mr. Burling and so on. So this idea of caricaturizing, particularly the upper class. And remember the purpose of, you know, Shakespeare would be criticizing his society, um, but he'd often do it through um, these kind of subtle means. It, it would never be specifically be about the king. It would never be about England. He'd always set his plays in another place, Venice, Scotland, anywhere other than England, so that he could satirize the court without having his head chopped off, essentially. And again, we assume the common people would have would have understood that. And his influence here is in the Canterbury Tales, as we've discussed, the ideas of courtly love, but also the satire, as we've just discussed, of the social classes. So we can see that again, that thread line of literature coming through, particularly in the comedies of Shakespeare here. And finally, in terms of Shakespeare, let's um, have a little look at his sonnets, which again are quite a nice way in, um, in terms of the curriculum to introduce and continue to bring in Shakespeare. Obviously, they have the, the big texts, you know, in, in Key Stage 3 of Othello and, and Midsummer Night's Dream. But to bring in his sonnets, particularly when studying poetry, allows us to draw those um, those kind of com similarities and differences um, when we study them. So Shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets, plus an extra six are found in his plays. So you could argue that those are technically part of his sonnets. Um, and, and he's drawing here on the Renaissance tradition. So it's again, as we've discussed, um, a take off the heroic verse and the iambic pentameter and the ideas of courtly love. Um, but what's interesting about Shakespeare's sonnets is that he departs from convention so often. 
So for example, in sonnet 130, um, when he talks about his mistress, and usually it should be about how, you know, how beautiful and how God, how kind of almost like a goddess she is, he does the opposite. And it's and it does it for specific effect, um, and he does that obviously through all his writing. Um, but it's interesting to show that to students, particularly when you think about Romeo and Juliet, for example, and we think about the 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 um, the opening and how it's a riff off the sonnet in that it's in sonnet form. Um, but he, instead of being about love, it's instead about something very different. So again, it's something that we can bring in um, to students at certain times where relevant. Okay, so we're kind of moving quickly through from Shakespeare to the Victorian period, so particularly the, the writers that students will be studying uh, throughout the curriculum. And again, I want us to look at three specific aspects of, um, of Victorian writing. And obviously, there's far more than this, but Gothic writing, which of course comes into play um, when they do their, their kind of Gothic anthology, so the dark narratives on elements of supernatural and horror. Then social protest writing or political writing or the social novel, uh, where we see that clear difference between the classes, where we see the voiceless in society being given a voice, and that becomes prevalent uh, more in the Victorian period, as does feminist writing, mainly because we now have more female writers. They're allowed a voice, uh, although it's often in, you know using a, a male pseudonym, um, but they are then able to express that female experience in a more realistic light, as well as subvert stereotypes created by by male writers, um, which becomes really influential, obviously, going forward into the 20th century and 21st. So one of the most significant aspects um, of the Victorian period in terms of literature is Gothic writing, um, which didn't originate in the Victorian period. Um, it, it was kind of coming in through um, through the kind of novels like uh, Castle of Otranto and, and even before that, Macbeth. So Macbeth um, did have a significant influence on the literature, the Gothic literature of the Victorian period, elements of the supernatural, claustrophobia. So that became quite an important Gothic text later on, although it wouldn't be considered um, categorized as Gothic, um, as well as kind of biblical allusions to go right back to kind of the more spirits, prophecies, sin and consequence, those elements of, of, of the Holy Bible do um, play a part uh, quite significantly in Gothic writing. Um, so uh, dark narratives, um, you have aspects of the pursued protagonist, so um, usually it's female um, being kind of chased a lot. You have high emotions, so people really having, um, you know, r real anger like Heathcliff, you know, real shock uh, and real um, surprise like uh, Lockwood. So you get these characters showing these emotions, entrapment, the gothic villain, so it's the rise of this kind of over-the-top archetypal villain, um, the Byronic hero or Byronic villain, depends on how you look at that, uh, but kind of in the in the uh, tradition of Lord Byron, you get people like Heathcliff, who's kind of this brooding, um, villainous uh, character. Uh, and then you have these motifs that pop up a lot in terms of windows, locks, and doors. You see these um, in... Um, in Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, you see them in, in Wuthering Heights, um, and they kind of represent that sense of claustrophobia, entrapment, um, and obviously Gothic writing is a big part of, of the curriculum, uh, particularly in year seven, and so the texts on the screen, the blue box there, um, are all texts that at least in terms of extracts, students will be exposed to, and it's a great springboard um, into, for example, Macbeth later on with the elements of the um, of the Gothic, uh, as well as um, obviously Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, um, if students are studying that. So, um, so Gothic writing, uh, definitely you can see the, the influence of earlier texts, the Bible, even medieval, you know, there's a lot of kind of the, the architecture uh, is quite medieval in, um, in Gothic literatures, lots of castles and fortresses, again, playing into that element of claustrophobia, which we see in, uh, even in Othello, we see a lot of that. Um, so we get those dark, tragic ideas kind of threading through into Gothic literature. So another um, type of literature that had um, prominence in the Victorian period was the the social novel, 
or social protest writing or political writing. So it's in that sense of socialism having a, a real rise in the Victorian period. And this was because of industrialization and the Reform Act in 1832. So we see the emergence of cities in the industrial age, which brings about obviously great opportunity, but also great poverty as well. And you get that um, that sense of the, the rich and the poor divide becoming even more obvious. Um, you have the, uh, there was a famous map, um, I can't remember the name of the person who did it, but a map where they painted it in black and gold, gold being the more affluent areas and black being the, uh, the poorest areas. And what they often found were these areas uh, we're often in very close proximity to each other. Uh, in fact, you turn one corner of London uh, and you'd go from the kind of the biggest houses to the to the most deprived slums. So a more socialist message uh, emerged during this time, highlighting the plight of the lower class and the corruption of the upper class. And we see that obviously in Charles Dickens in almost everything he writes, uh, William Blake as well in his poetry. So for example, London, you see that really kind of come through, but also in, in a lot of the other uh, poems he writes. Um, Victor H Hugo, obviously with Les Miserables, thinking more about French literature. Um, and Elizabeth Gaskell as well, who will be more prominent with the feminism uh, aspect too, but um, novels such as North and South, where she's really showing that divide, and as well as George Eliot, Charlotte Bronte, and many others. So the key aspects of social protest writing would be the everyman protagonist, and we see this um, starting with um, uh, Renaissance uh, literature, thinking back to, uh, even back to um, Chaucer, and the way that he started to focus on these everyman characters. Uh, we see this um, in social protest writing because we want a sense of realism uh, and we want a sense of empathy with the plight of the common man. We have more colloquial dialect and we see this coming up a lot. So um, kind of using prose to, uh, to write out uh, phonetically uh, the accents. And the idea behind this would be that um, firstly that we get a sense of realism again, but also uh, we understand the confusion um, and disparity between uh, different classes and how they struggle to understand each other. So think about the dialect in, for example, uh, Wuthering Heights in the second um, second part of that, uh, where really you really struggle to understand characters like Joseph because, the, because of the accent. Um, characterization as a vehicle for viewpoints. So we begin seeing um, characters having the the viewpoint of the actual author and so those characters being a vehicle for them to present their own views and we see elements of of comedy so caricatures and, and satire and parody which again we would have seen in Chaucer it threads through into the comedies of Shakespeare and now it's being used for political means a bit more uh, kind of obviously um, in uh, social protest writing. So think about uh, Charles Dickens and his use of caricatures in order to ridicule uh, and satire the upper class. So obviously we've talked about the uh, the influence um, from the past that's had on social protest writing in the Victorian period um, and that moves on. You can see that in, for example, an Inspector Calls by J.B. Priestley, which students will study in year 10, where you see that thread coming through of, of Charles Dickens. Um, you see that thread coming through um, from William Blake, that sense of, again, using uh, the inspector as a vehicle, using caricatures like Mr. Burling, all those kind of key aspects of social uh, protest writing are used there as they are when we get to kind of a level with handmaid's tale or uh, kite runner we see those elements perhaps more subtly um, but we do see them and during this period as well remember this was the rise of the serial um, in terms of um, we wouldn't have had a, a novel necessarily particularly with people like Dickens or Arthur Conan Doyle but their um, chapter by chapter this would have been released um, into a magazine and these magazines, of course, uh, create that sense of, um, you know, cliffhangers and that kind of thing. So the, the idea of the, the narrative does change in this period from being a whole text to being episode, episodic, essentially. Uh, and so that does have an influence on the writing later, uh, which we'll look at. Okay, and also Victorian uh, literature, we see the rise of more feminist writing. And this is essentially because 
uh, women are now able to write. We get finally to hear the voices of women rather than having our depictions of women characterized by men. And so from that patriarchal standpoint, um, the women that we've read up until now have been idealized or stereotyped. And again, we see that in, for example, Shakespeare, even though we could argue, you know, his viewpoint is quite empathetic. You know, we have certain kind of um, female characters which they'll look at in year eight with Othello um, like Desdemona or Amelia that we might say oh actually you know this is a almost almost a feminine feminist um, uh, hero but actually he still is um, reinforcing those stereotypes uh, so now we get a swell of female voices emerging even if they have to use male pseudonyms to do that um, in order to express real female experiences and to ensure that characters that are female are not flat characters but round characters meaning they're not kind of two-dimensional stereotypes that are just used in the narrative and often these stereotypes follow the same kind of uh, tropes so you get um, the self-sacrificing angel is is one that's been identified the dissatisfied shrew is another and when they get uh, to a level um, they'll study those particularly in terms of uh, feminism and then you get obviously writers in the blue box there Jane Austen Emily Bronte Charlotte Bronte so think about Jane Austen's writing and how she is able to express feminist viewpoints or feminine viewpoints um, through um, through kind of more subtle means through sarcasm. So if we think about the first line of Pride and Prejudice, which is of course sarcastic, um, and that's maybe how she gets away with that at the time. We have Mary Shelley, um, who's important obviously because uh, students will study her writing. But the idea that you know she's writing uh, more Gothic texts like Frankenstein um, rather than what would be considered female writing at the time. There was certainly you know, Jane Austen, even though she's being satirical, she's sticking to her um, her lane in terms of uh, marriage and relationships and, and family. Here's Mary Shelley going off and, and having a male protagonist, and, and that's very, very important in terms of um, feminist literature. Uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, obviously very important in terms of um, feminism as, as, as was her husband um, and Robert Browning and I think it's important to note that feminist writing wasn't just something as today uh, that women are just um, championing but we had Robert Browning who's a real champion for feminist uh, writing and so even in his own writing we see more fleshed out female characters uh, more female perspectives and more empathy towards female experience. So key aspects that we might see, uh, things like the governess novel, uh, this was kind of all that really uh, women were often able to attain is kind of the role of governess, that kind of authority. So Charlotte Bronte uses that. Obviously subverting stereotypes, this idea of the new woman, woman because feminism wasn't a term used uh, during the Victorian literature, but this new woman, woman with a bit more, uh, you know, kind of stepping out of her pre-described roles and sat satire, sarcasm with Austen and subversion of stereotypes. And again, this is more a reaction in terms of influence from more um, the, the kind of biblical ideas uh, that were prevalent. You think about Shakespeare's um, time with the um, depiction of, for example, Lady Macbeth and the witches, where we have the, the influential slash um, manipulative woman, which uh, has come from kind of the Adam and Eve uh, fable and that kind of coming through in literature and now finally being kind of subverted at this point. So the archetypes and the patriarchy, we're starting to see them break down in tandem with the socialist um, and social novel and the protest novel. So they kind of all kind of flow together, as do Romanticism, which we'll look at now. Okay, so finally, uh, Romanticism, which, as I said previously, it does overlap with what we were looking at in terms of Victorian uh, literature, because it essentially happened at the same time, but it does have very different and um, very distinct ideas within it. So in terms of history, um, similar to the social novel, it's a reaction to the Industrial Revolution, as well as the Age of Enlightenment. So this idea that science was becoming um, far more prevalent and um, and this was kind of a reaction against that um, logical, um, almost kind of Greek um, idea um, that uh, people were taking on. Um, and so it was in, in connection with 
as, as we've said, social protest and feminist writing. The philosophy behind it was uh, more of an emphasis on emotion being important, the importance of emotion. So again, that reaction to the Enlightenment um, and individualism. So your individual experience being important, which is why it holds hands with uh, the social novel. And the glorification of past and nature. Now we talk about glorification of past, uh, it's kind of less about classical literature and more back to that medieval literature. So we actually see um, some of those ideas coming through. Obviously John Keats does refer to Greek literature in his poetry, but we get a lot more of the medieval ideas coming in as well. Um, and that sense of kind of chivalry and um, courtly love do come back into uh, romanticism. So imagination, uh, the aesthetic experience, again, common man, much like with socialist uh, writing, uh, childhood as well being quite important. So coming back, think about what Blake does with uh, um, Songs of Innocence, um, going back to the importance of um, of, of that childhood uh, innocence, that childlike, or Wordsworth doing the same thing in the prelude perhaps, and again, individualism. So the poetry, would often focus on the transcendent power of nature. So um, nature being um, almost transformative and by being around and in nature, it will change um, perspective and almost free mankind from the shackles caused by, individ uh, by industrialism. Um, so the, again, the dangers of industrialism and return to the medieval style. So the sublime um, supernaturalism. So again, looking at the spiritual aspects, uh, transcendent power of nature, the melancholy as well is often quite sad poems um, and, and actually reveling in that and sitting in that uh, as well as we said like lyrical ballads so right back to what we were looking at at the start in the oral tradition that comes back as well into romanticism. Okay, so that's our whistle-stop tour of uh, thousands of years of literature. And I, again, have to apologize um, for everything that I would have missed out, things that I would have uh, perhaps even got confused with. Um, obviously, that's going to happen when we're spanning this kind of time frame. But the main idea I want us to get hold of is um, the threads that are weaving through. And we need to be um, considering this when we're planning and teaching. Uh, we need to help students understand that that no text is in isolation, that every text is informed by its history and context. Um, and, and that's how we can start tracking through even as we go from year seven to year eight. Um, hopefully students get that idea of the continuity of the curriculum and, and how texts have progressed and transformed and changed over time and actually cycled right back. So you think back to what we said about um, romanticism going all the way back to our medieval ideas. Uh, and hopefully then that will not only give them more of an understanding of literature but a love of it as well as we're sharing um, thank you very much for um, for taking the time to do this um, this part of the course uh, hopefully it's been helpful for you but do please let us know if there's things you feel are really important that we've missed out or anything else that you want to find out about